Hello, folks. Come along while we get our 600 square foot of garden space planted for the year. This space produced a little over 600 pounds of produce for our household to eat last year. And that is in a climate that it does not have a first and last frost date. So this might work for spring or fall or even winter gardening for you. Hey, folks. Carol over here trying to get the garden actually finished being planted. I am now late on that for the year by a little bit um tiny bit because of the weather the uh the snow of course took a very long time to melt this year i think we only have a couple little snow piles left behind the shop at this point and then just a lot of time being spent the past few weeks with burley's care um prevented me from doing some of what I was needing to do. And in the past few days, it's just been a combo of wind and um, snow, ice, or rain showers. So I did get the potatoes planted the other night. I'll throw that in here in a minute. It was just so windy. There was no way I could plant the little seed stuff because they would have all just blown out of my hands and I couldn't have told for sure where they were ending up. But we're going to see if we can get everything else planted this morning before another thunderstorm rolls in or anything else happens. So I'm going to try to do a complete, in this video, a complete step-by-step -step planting the entire garden, which may be helpful if you plant any of the same things I do and give you an idea of the things we plant here in our climate and why. So here we go. my little seed carrying suitcase here and first thing we're going to plant in this bed is peas. This trellis that you just saw me stick in seems to work quite well. I've been using it for many years now. It's This one was already cut for something else but it's basically a cattle panel split in half and then the half you clip every other um, wire and so it gives you kind of stakes to stick it into the ground and that's always worked really well you can see it's a little wobbly i gotta run down to the shop and grab a couple zip ties and just kind of tie the different um bits together it keeps it a little straighter looking it'd work fine if i didn't but this is going to give our peas a trellis to climb on so i'm planting two varieties this year ones that i've found tend to do very well for us these are tall telephone which are an heirloom variety introduced in 1881 long vines large pods with eight to ten peas each but sweet and tender I, this is one that's done very well for me in the past and that i've really liked so because i'm planting garden beds here and i kind of weed as i plant these are little bits of garlic seeds i had a garlic um, that went to seed in this bed two years ago now anyway i can see some of them are are germinating and that's great that's just not what i'm growing in here this year. So down each side of the trellis, I'm not just doing rows, I'm gonna stagger them. So I'm gonna put one, then I'm gonna come out and do a zigzag and then in. So I'm kind of doing a double zigzagged row and I'm gonna do this on each side of the trellis. If I stop planting, I've learned I have to put in a little stick or I'll lose track because I can't see. So here I go with my zigzag, just a single pea seed each place. I'm just pushing it down maybe about a half inch um, through the compost layer mulch that's on top. And I'm going, what is that, two and a half, three inches apart. I tend to plant my stuff a little bit denser sometimes than the seed packet may recommend. Part of that is I've got pretty fertile soil. And part of it is that I, um, I know a lot of things aren't going to have time to get to the full size that they may otherwise grow to if they were in a warmer climate. So that seems to have worked well for, for me for years now. You could pre-soak your pea seeds before planting them. I do some years. I just did not get to it this year. So in they go. We had a pretty good downpour last night. Um, for us, it, it rained like over a quarter inch. That's a pretty massive rainstorm. Um, and of course, everything's still 
fairly moist from the, the snow melting, so I think these will germinate well just like this with no issues. Um, and getting them just under that compost. I found when I was in the clearing, I had to kind of be sure I I messed up the, the surface so you couldn't see where the little holes were poked when I was done. Otherwise, right when I never had other problems with chipmunks or squirrels in the garden, but right when I plant, if I left it looking like a hole where somebody buried a treasure, they would come along and find that hole and take that seed right out of there and eat it, especially with peas or beans. So I'm just doing my zigzaggy row down both sides here. Um, these are whole peas, so they're ones where you don't eat the shell. You grow them and shell them. And that's, I do grow some sugar snaps. We'll be planting those in a different bed in a minute. I learned the hard way. It is a good idea to not plant them beside each other because once they're growing, it can be rather hard to tell which one is which. And if you pick and fry up a whole pea in a stir fry or something, it is very tough and stringy when you try to eat it. And when you try to shell a sugar snap pea, they uh, just kind of mush and you don't get anything. So it's worth keeping them just in separate beds is what I've found. So I'll we'll see how I go here. I think we're gonna go, we got two varieties, so we're gonna go right about to this join with the tall telephones. And just doing my zigzag row here where they should all be able to grow up. Again, I'm going to stick my little stake in to mark where I stopped. Grow up and reach the trellis just fine. And these are one of our favorite foods to eat. If I have more garden bed space, which someday we will here, we just have to get quack grass thoroughly killed out and get more beds created. And that's just a long process. I've got too many things to do. But um, if I had more space, I would plant tons more peas because that's something we love eating through the winter and they freeze very, very well. Um, so we could, there's almost no amount of peas I could grow that we couldn't eat through a year, whether it was fresh or frozen or even dehydrated. Dehydrated peas are great to throw back into various things but we will end up eating the majority of these fresh and hopefully having enough to um, freeze some, would be my guess. So I've done that on one side. Here's what pea seeds look like. It's kind of like shriveled up, bland looking peas. And I am going to come do the same thing down the other side. Again, the same zigzag pattern, just out and in just off of my my trellis these are probably gonna go well over the top of the trellis because they could get up to six feet tall and this is only like three feet but i can't do a taller trellis with my current garden set up because i need the frost covers to be able to go over the top so when they get to there then they just kind of flop over but this is still such a productive pea that I decided it's worth planting anyway, even with the, the limitations I have here. And by the way, welcome if you're newer and wonder what uh, the conditions are we're growing in here. I'm at a little over 6,300 feet above sea level in the Wyoming mountains. It is winter here, approximately eight months a year. That is with snow on the ground. We get frost and freezes all summer long. Um, there is no first or last frost date in this area. And uh, usually pretty dry all summer. We get almost all of our moisture as snow in the winter. Very, very little rain in the summer. Some in the spring, some in the fall, and very often almost none through the rest of the, the summer. So, and if you're wondering what growing zone I'm in, it's somewhere between a three or a four, but that's actually pretty meaningless for growing annual veggie crops like this. Here's a little bit of a carrot that was left from last year. Um, because what growing zones tell you is useful for some things. It tells you the coldest temperature that you can expect to get during the winter. Now your apple tree, if it gets to a colder temperature than your apple can handle, 
even in the middle of winter, your tree will die. So that's a useful thing to, to know. Um, what it does not tell you is if, say, your coldest temperature is 25 degrees below zero, uh, it doesn't tell you at all whether or not it's going to be that temperature for one day in the winter or 200 consecutive days. And that makes a big difference on your annual crops. Now, in general, if, you, so if you're in a zone 10, you're generally going to have warmer, longer growing day amounts than if you're in a zone 2. There are people in zone 3, like me, who have a massively longer growing season. They actually have a first and last frost state and no freezes in the middle of that that they can grow in. Here we do not have that. Uh, if you look up one of those garden calculators, you can put in your um, zip code or whatever and it'll tell you when your first and last frost date is. It informs me that we don't have a growing zone and recommends a greenhouse. But with the frost covers and these raised bed setups, we've successfully grown a lot of food for many years. Uh, last year the, the garden produced for 640 pounds of produce out of about 600 square feet of actual bed space. So that's doing pretty good considering we don't have a, a growing climate. But that's the environment we're working with and why I do a lot of specifically what I do. So if you're also in a really cold climate, hopefully some of my experiences are helpful. And some of this just applies to gardening stuff in general. So I'm done with my telephone peas. We're going to put in our other variety on the other end. That little seed suitcase organizer thing is designed, you can probably tell, for photo storage, but it makes a wonderful way to organize your garden seeds. These are, oh, wrong ones. Those are sugar ands. They are not what I wanted. Those are sugar snap pea. And like I just said, I've learned I don't want to plant those beside my hall peas because I get too confused. Alaska, that's what I was looking for. Alaska is a variety that always seems to do very well for me here. So here's my little stake to mark where I stopped sticking in my tall telephones. And I'm just going to do the same thing exactly down here with Alaska. And I might not have quite enough of them, so we may end up doing a little bit of a third variety. I'll see how the, the seeds hold out here, but I think I've got enough to do the other half of this center of the bed with all Alaskas. So the first thing you might notice in this corner of the garden, see all these dirt tunnels piled clear up to there? This makes me really thankful I did move the garden beds a couple years ago. I didn't know if we'd have a pocket gopher problem here as well, but we definitely do. They tried in multiple places to get into the beds all over and without success, which was what we wanted. So this bed, these beds are both going to be potatoes. And just before I crush it too much here um, in walking around on it, I'm going to put some of this soil into the beds and off of the paths. But if you haven't had pocket gophers, dig big mounds of earth up into your paths. This is probably not part of the garden. That's so rocky, I'm not going to add that. Um, just incredible what they can do under the snow through the year. Anyway, uh, if you've got other questions about the garden bed, so we've got a meadow lark singing to us, um, garden bed setup itself. I have videos on assembling these twice in this spot and the first one. Um, if you got questions on how we filled them and all, you can find those videos. Um, this video, I'm going to try to just get my whole garden planting for the year into a single video. Or at least I won't pack all of that down as I walk on it here. Pull some rocks out. Just spread this out because beds always sink a little every year, especially where they've only been here for two years. So it's nice to have some, some more refill. Okay, so I started right there placing my potatoes. I like to place all of my potatoes before I plant any so that I don't lose track where I put them and not. 
These obviously are pretty sprouty. These are ones we grew last year. Um, they have made it till planting time. I do often cut my potatoes up for planting so that I get as many potatoes out of uh, the seeds that I, potatoes I have as possible. In this instance, I happen to have plenty, so I'm just planting them whole. But you can find other videos where I've done that. Like this one, for example, everywhere there's a sprout starting is an eye. I can cut that into two or three chunks, but I'm simply going to plant them whole this year because I can. Also, they do not have to be nearly this sprouted or sprouted at all. It's actually easier to plant that or one with no sprouts than one that looks like this. But this is the stage they're at. The snow just melted off of our ground, so I could not plant them before. So you can kind of see what I'm doing here. No great science to it, but I'm kind of staggering them back and forth. There's about eight, nine inches between potatoes. That's a spacing that seems to work pretty well for me. And like I said, I just kind of go down the whole bed, spacing them out so that I don't lose track of what I have put where. Because once you bury them, they have learned the hard way. That's a little easy to do. So if I place them all first, then that's not an issue. These, I believe, are all German butter balls. sprouty, but we are planting these guys instead. Okay, so now that I got my two beds all spaced out, I'm going to actually plant them. And this, once again, is much easier to do if you do not have long sprouts like this. This is not not only not necessary, it's not even desirable. But in each spot, because I've got some of my composty mulch right on top, I'm going to just make a nice little hole. There, I've got some root mass left from something else that was in here last year. But I'm going to basically tuck the potato down in and just pat the dirt back over it. You can kind of see why I choose to mark all of my spots first because as soon as you hide one it can be pretty hard to tell where you have and haven't planted them. This end of the bed I had some perennials. Oh this was, I know what that is. That was uh, basil roots from last year. Anyway with longer sprouts like that I do my best to not break them off, kind of lay them sideways, bury them as much as they can. Any part of the sprout that gets buried will grow uh, roots and the parts that stick out the top will probably, where they're not hardened off, probably end up getting burnt off with a frost. That's okay. So kind of just patting them in like that. If you don't have great big long sprouts on them, this, once again, is even easier. Just tuck it in wouldn't have anything sticking up at all. Like for instance, this one, it's still got a sprout, but it's the closest to not having any. Um, just kind of making a, a hole there. Just push it down in, add that stuff back on top. So I'm going to go on down the bed, planting all of these just like that. cooperate to let you guys hear me. I wanted to mention a few other things about potatoes. They do really well uh, for us here in these raised beds. The only reason we have raised beds is because of those little munchy pocket gophers that would otherwise and have before destroyed the entire garden. If it wasn't for that, there's no reason you have to have a raised bed. Well, there's a few other reasons. I have some friends who live in a place that is all solid bedrock. So they have raised beds because they don't 
have soil, so on, but you certainly don't have to have a raised bed. But you can also grow potatoes in just about any kind of container. Um, the bigger it is in general, probably the better and the less you'd have to water. But these beds are only eight inches deep, which is not the most ideal, but it works. I've grown lots and lots of potatoes for years in them. You can go back and watch the harvest from last year where these two beds produced us about 240 pounds of potatoes. Um, so that works. If you uh, have a balcony or something and want to grow some potatoes, you can do it. And again, they absolutely do not have to have sprouts this long. This is far from ideal. But one of the neat things about potatoes is, you with a great big long sprout like that, any part of it that's below ground will grow roots. And any part that's above ground will grow leaves. Um, which is kind of neat. Tomatoes are another plant that does that. But in my case, the parts that I can't get buried that are sticking out are unlikely to actually grow leaves because they're probably going to freeze off where they've been indoors and in a, a warmer area. There, I don't think that bit is going to be hardy enough. So it'll probably freeze back to the ground. That's what it does most springs when I've had this leggy of runner potatoes to plant and it'll just grow back out for underneath. But if you didn't have that issue, it would just start greening up and growing leaves off of any part that was above ground. And these beds are, are never tilled. They, the potato beds get turned over a little more than some of our others just because of the process of getting potatoes out of them in the fall. But we do that by hand as well. And um, they, everything seems to do really well. Less work, healthier soil, less watering, less weeding since I've been doing no-till beds like this, which I've been doing for Oh, basically my whole adult life. Um, when I was young, we, you know, tilled up a giant area, planted things in big single rows, etc. So I was used to gardening that way. But I think this is vastly superior. And the partially decomposed layer of mulch and compost on top helps hold in moisture and protect the soil through the winter. Um, you can go back and see videos last fall from putting that on. But that helps protect things here because I can't grow any kind of winter cover crop because I grow my summer crops right from snow cover to snow cover. There is still some snow behind the tiny house, which is, you know, like 20 feet from this end of the garden, maybe 30. Um, so that mulch layer adds nutrients to the soil, but also helps keep the, the soil surface, you know, protected winter, of course, a big snowpack also does some benefit to that. But overall, I think these are a pretty easy crop to grow. They uh, are probably better grown if you have a little more space, but if you just like potatoes, try plant some, even if you only have like a pot or a balcony. Um, lots of people grow them in planters. I know there are ways that people like to do where they plant them and then kind of fill up layers over them so they grow more and more uh, potatoes through the season. You can do that. I can't say I know anybody personally who's had great success with that. You do have to have the right potato varieties. Uh, I forget if it's determinate or indeterminate to make that work. For me it's a, a moot issue because in this climate they can't even uh, fill up all that they would grow in this eight inches of soil before freeze this fall so this works well for me but it also shows that you can grow them just like this without doing any of that so we'll see if these guys can beat their predecessors harvest we get more than 240 pounds this fall that would be awesome and we ate all of that except for what you see me planting here um, but not quite all of this. The ones on this end that came out of that last box you saw me using were actually a gift from somebody else who didn't uh, have a use for them as sprouted potatoes. So the, the first two varieties, the butterballs, and I think they're called Viking something. I'd have to go look at my garden map 
um, kind of purple skin, white potato. Um, those were ones we had grown last year. And these, I gotta confirm what variety they were. Not positive, but they were a gift from somebody else. about all of the potatoes planted. Really hoping this breeze was going to quit. Often the breeze dies down towards sunset, but this one is not giving up and that makes the filming really hard for audio. There we go. I'm moving over to another bed here to do some more peas and I like to, as soon as I am done sticking something in the dirt, put uh, a record on paper. I've got a little garden bed map. Um, it's not necessarily to scale or anything, but just says where everything is. And so I want to mark down that I put Alaska peas on this end and tall telephone on that end. And partly what this lets me do is learn what I've learned over the years which varieties do the best here because I'm able to go back later and at the end of the year say oh well the ones on this end they just seem to do better we like the taste better or whatever more than anything else um the ones at that end we just didn't like so much and, and be able to know for sure which variety was which and then plant what we like the most so that's how I've come to a lot of my conclusions over the years now these are my sugar snap peas these are the ones where you eat the whole pod like in a stir fry or a salad or just as a fresh snack, I, I love peas. Sugar Ann is my favorite of all the um, sugar snap peas that I have planted over the years. So that is what we are doing down this little bed. These are another thing that if I had lots and lots of bed space, I would plant many more rows of. Um, so maybe someday, but that's what we're gonna do in here. Again, we've got the same trellis set up. It's pretty sturdy as you can see, just with those, um, ends of the every other wire on the panel stuck into the ground and I'm planting these in the exact same manner as zigzag down each side of the trellis. Now we're going to have other stuff on the beds beside this but I kind of need to plant each of my beds in a curve shape so the tallest stuff will be in the middle and shorter stuff toward the edges so that the frost covers that go over these hoops you're looking at will work. And I just if you're wondering stick a single seed into each of these little holes I'm poking just with my fingers because the dirt's plenty soft. I occasionally pull a weed or pick a rock um, while I'm doing this. I have generally had somewhere between 99 and 100 percent germination rates with seeds, even seeds that I've kept for up to at least four or five years. I haven't really stored many longer than that because I tend to use them up by that point, um, but I've done a whole video on seed storage and how I get excellent germination year after year with seeds. Now all the varieties we plant are also heirloom so that means they're open pollinated. I could save my own pea seeds and um, you know use them as my seed crop to plant for the next year. Uh, most crops I can't you know, I could theoretically do it. I can't actually do it because our season isn't long enough here to get a mature, we get a green one that's ready to eat, but not to get a mature one that would actually germinate like these, where it's grown the whole way out and dried out because the plants will freeze before that happens. My peas will usually still be blooming uh, when they go under snow for the fall. Um, so I do tend to buy more, more seeds. The majority of mine have come from rareseeds.com, Baker Creek Seeds over the years. I've always had excellent uh, success with their seeds. And I have a whole list um, under this video, if you check it out, I'll link to a, a blog post I did that has a whole list of other good heirloom seed companies that I am aware of. So that is my sugar snap peas. So we're going to, as you can see, I've got enough left in that packet that I will definitely be planting them for a couple more years before running out of those. And my fingers aren't too dirty for my map here. 
we will just write down that we did sugar ants down the middle of this bed. Okay, so while we're here, beside this, because again I want my bed to go kind of in a, that shape for the sake of the frost covers, we are going to plant just a few radishes on one of these sides. I kind of like, well, I don't actually like radishes fresh that much. They're too spicy for me. Um, but, but what I do like is them either cooked when they get, they just cook up, like, especially if you roast them, like a really nice root vegetable. Um, or what often happens is they end up going to seed and not making a um, an actual root for me. I'm not sure why. So this year I'm going to plant these three varieties. I'm not sure how you pronounce all of those, but uh, three different varieties, not a lot of each. Um, but for some reason here, I think probably because we have such big temperature swings in the summer, we can easily go from below freezing to 80 degrees um, in a single day. Um, <laughs> that uh, they tend to often not make a, a good um, bulb and instead will go to seed. But when radishes bloom, they are a beautiful flower that pollinators love. Our bees love them and all the wild bees and, and such in the area as well. I'm just kind of sprinkling these across the surface here. And then I just kind of rake the seeds in just a teeny bit with my fingertips. Um, that seems to work just fine. Ooh, so, and then after they bloom, they make these seed pods on the, the radish flowers. And those are also beautiful and edible. If you pick them while they're young, they're kind of like a spicy green bean. So if your radishes go to seed, don't, uh, don't pull them up or anything. Let them bloom. Pollinators will love you and then eat the seed pods. Now there are also varieties called rat tail radishes that are grown specifically for their seed pods and I have some of those as well. They're not even grown for the root but the seed pod on any radish is edible. So that's something you maybe don't know. But you do want to pick them young or they start to get stringy. Kind of like a green bee would if you don't pick it fairly early. So I'm going to get our radishes in there. So this side of the bed has, and I'm hoping actually that that's going to be a thunderstorm that's going to rain all these seeds in, um, but not till I'm done planting. <laughs> so we got those two on that side. I'm going to do some of these. This is a variety I haven't tried before, the Malaga or whatever. They're supposed to be a round root with a deep plum purple color and snow white flesh. That's a Polish variety. Often things from other cold countries tend to do the best here, understandably. So Polish variety sounded like one that maybe would handle our weather well. And then I'm going to actually leave this little section of the bed open. I have a golden globe... Um, uh, turnip I would like to try planting there because we haven't grown any turnips we actually liked eating yet. That one sounded like one that maybe we would and I don't have the seeds with me right now because I told my brother he could plant some too because there was plenty in the pack. So he has that seed pack and as soon as I get it back I will plant this last kind of half of this side with some turnips. So this next little bed matches the same size as the one we just planted. Over here I'm going to do in lettuce and I like to do a lot of varieties of lettuce every year because I think all the pretty colors and textures and patterns that lettuce exists in are really neat. But again, just to keep me from getting confused, if I take a little stick and I mark out, because I'm going to do 10 varieties, so I'm going to kind of mark little patches here so that I know where I've put them and not, so that I can tell what, what when I'm planting, it becomes pretty obvious once they come up. That's not too big of an issue. That little stick's coming apart. But I'm just gonna do this. You can kind of see how that's leaving a little 
um, dent in the soil that just all I need it for, like I said, is, is while I'm planting to get, you know, my stuff kind of into the, the right spot. So I've got that bed kind of marked into 10 little blocks and this will be plenty of lettuce for everything we can eat through the, the winter or through the summer and we eat a good bit of salads and stuff. So this one is Lola Rosa. It's a kind of um, pretty bright red, red variegated one. I always get more seeds than I need, but I do the same thing, kind of sprinkle them in here. That is quite plenty. It feels like I use no seeds out of that bag. Um, I'm gonna just leave mine here till I fill out my, my garden map so I know what I put where once again. And so in each of these little box, really, I don't like taking the time to set each seed in its own little hole with something like lettuce, but you know, eight to 12 seeds would be plenty in that amount of space. And I'm doing more than that. That is May Queen. That's a butterball one we really like. This is Rogue de Hiver. It's another kind of bronzy colored one. This is actually one of Baker Creek's free seed packets, which is nice. If you order a bunch of seeds, they always send you some free ones. Um, often their free ones are uh, tomatoes or something I can't grow. So it was neat that that time they sent a pack of lettuce because I can. Um, this is Mizuna 605 Summer. <coughs> 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 This is not really a lettuce, but it grows a, a funny crinkly green that is just beautiful. And I don't so much enjoy a lot of it by itself, but mixed in with other things in a salad, it's a really pretty color, flavor, and texture. So I like to grow a little bit of that. This is Merville des Quattro Saisons. Probably totally butchered that pronunciation. Uh, it's another, it's mostly green with a little bit of bronze tips on the edge. Very beautiful lettuce as well. And then I come around to this side and I've got garnet rose. This one I will seed a little bit heavier than some because some of these deep, deep red colors I've noticed are one of the few things I don't get a great germination on. Whether the seed's new or old, I don't know what it is, but because it's with various varieties, but the, the deep red colored lettuces just don't seem to germinate as well. So I'm gonna assume a few of those seeds will be duds. Uh, tennis ball, this is a, maybe if I had to pick one lettuce just for its taste, um, I might pick tennis ball as my very favorite because it's this lovely little juicy, sweet, crunchy, um, bright green, limey, green, yellow um, head of lettuce. Merlot, this is another dark variety that's again beautiful mixed in with other things, but I'm going to seed heavy because they just don't seem to germinate as easily as the other varieties. Bronze Beauty, this might be my, maybe my second favorite. It's hard to pick. It's hard to narrow it down to 10 varieties every year for me. It's another green one with lovely bronzed edges that I think is just beautiful. And this last one is one I've never tried. It's a Cagraner Summer Butterhead type from Victory Seeds and it looked like it would be a fun variety. And so every year I try to plant the majority of things I know will do well, but it's also fun to try a few new things. And I have no reason to think that any variety of lettuce won't grow here because every kind I've ever tried has. So we're gonna plant them and mostly just see how we like them. And now the next thing I'm gonna do again before I forget, what I've put where is fill in my garden map. So now that I've sprinkled them all on the surface, I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the radish seeds. And I kind of just, not even really raking it, but just kind of massaging the ground surface with my finger tips. And that, and if I see a little weed, I just pull it. There's not too many because of the garden bed prep last fall. Um, that kind of just settles the seeds just below the surface and seems to work pretty good versus making a, a row and trying to individually seed them in a row because with the way the frost covers work for me, having everything in a big wide bed 
works much better. So I'm going to massage each variety into its soil. Kind of pass them down. And that will be the lettuce planted for the year. So we are done with that bed. And that does mean that the seeds are ending up mostly in the kind of composty mulch layer on the top and not even really into the soil. But they will put roots into the soil with no problem. And um, that will work out just fine. If you think about what a plant does in nature, it just drops its seeds somewhere near or around it, depending how the seeds fall or blow. I don't know if you guys can hear all the birds. The hummingbirds and the various other little birds are all busy this morning, which is lovely to hear. Um, but it doesn't dig a hole and bury its seeds. They just kind of end up in the, the composting litter on the surface of the ground um, under or near its parent plant and grow the next spring. Some year I'd like to try actually planting my entire garden late, late in the fall, put all the seeds in and just see if they stay protected enough like all the wild things under the snow all year to just come up in the spring without having to plant in the spring, but I've never tried it. So that's lettuce done. So moving right along here, this bed's gonna all be beets, but I wanted to point out here, you can see another spot where pocket gophers tried, well, they did tunnel under the garden bed. They tried to get into it through the winter by tunneling under it, but that hardware cloth underneath, and if you haven't seen how we made the beds, go look up those videos. Um, they're specifically to protect from those little munchy monsters. Um, that prevented them. They got under the hardware cloth, but not into the bed. So this whole bed is going to be beets. I love beets. We like them pickled, uh, canned, uh, sauteed up with butter, fresh, roasted with other root veggies, uh, shredded, and um, they're just a wonderful, wonderful food. And they grow well here. This is, you will notice, part of what we do. We grow the things that grow well here and then we eat them because it's what grows <laughs> but i also like beets so i usually plant three kinds um choiga i call them candy cane beets pink striped we're going to do those um, i got two packs of those because i think that one's about to run out then i'm going to do some red ones let's see do i do early wonder this year or egyptian these are both ones i've liked um let's do early wonder this is an old heirloom pre-1811 variety and I'll save the Egyptians for next year. I got too many beet varieties because they're lovely. And then my other favorite, golden beets, which just have a really rich earthy flavor and are nice if you're in a hurry and you don't want to stain, like when you're cooking, you don't want to stain everything you're touching in dark red because the red beets will do that, even though I love them. But both the candy stripes stain less and the, the yellows don't have any of the red in. So I'm gonna do this bed in thirds. And again, I pull a little weed anytime I see one here while I'm doing this. I'm gonna start with goldens on this end. And what I've found seems to work pretty well. I've tried different things with the beets over the years, putting them in kind of rows, putting them in singly. Um, before I get distracted with my planting here and go the whole way across the bed, I better mark out a line of about a third because I can get my head down here and, and forget what I'm doing. Um, beets are a very funny shaped seed to me, but what I've found seems to work best is planting about three in a little clump. Like I take three seeds, start at a corner and put them, sometimes it ends up being four because they stick together, um, put them in one little hole with one push in. And again, I'm going down about, I don't know, a little over a quarter inch, closer to a half inch into the soil and I'm gonna do a zigzag. So hole, 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 you get the idea. Um, and they seem to have grown really well. We got, I forget, close to 100 pounds of beets out of this bed last year. Um, that doesn't even count the beet greens that we ate some of through the summer. We have so many greens things that grow here in the summer that it's hard to eat all of them, even as much greens as we eat. Um, but they kind of grow in a clump and they all just kind of shoulder each other out of the way. And out of each clump, I can pick the, the biggest one that's growing, you know, first and eat that kind of midsummer. And 
then uh, you know the others have a little more room to grow. Anyway, that just seemed to work really well. So I put three or four in each little hole, but again, I'm doing my same staggered pattern and I'm gonna do it the whole way, you know, edge to edge across the bed. So my temptation is always to put too many seeds into one hole because these poor little seeds look so lonely and little when they go in the ground and it just feels like you should put more in but then the plants get too crowded so i've really worked on the years out over the years on forcing myself to only do a certain amount of seeds because i know that uh, i don't need more than that because they all grow or virtually all so we're just going to work our way across the entire bed here and do our golden beets our early wonders and our candy cane beets so get that done mark them on the map and we'll be back to plant the next thing oh and you can see probably behind our bed here of lettuce and our radishes and sugar snap peas we have a strawberry bed that's already planted because they're a perennial I don't know what variety of strawberries they are. I call them Christie's strawberries because my friend Christy gave me some of her plants many years ago and they've been propagated ever since. That bed is one I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna get to it today, but um, it's already planted. What I actually have to do is thin it because it put out so many runners um, through the year that there's now way too many plants in there. So I need to dig about two thirds or three quarters of them out and go plant them either somewhere else on the property or I think I'm gonna get my brother some uh, and so on just so the ones left have, have space to grow again. But that is already planted and I can't remember which angle the camera is pointing at. If you can see the bed behind me, that's the garlic bed. You saw us plant that last fall and they're all up. They come up usually just before the, the snow melts and are growing well. We've got music and Chesnick Red garlics, which have done phenomenally for us. We got 28 pounds of garlic out of that bed last year, which is the best garlic harvest I've ever gotten. And if you look up a garlic uh, planting video, I think I've got a few of them on the channel, you can find a link to the gentleman I got my seed garlic from that I've been very happy with uh, myself. And these were my own now, but they were they were seeds from the seed garlic I got from his. Um, and I've heard from several of you guys who also ordered his, uh, garlic from him that yours are doing well. So if you need a garlic source to get started, I'd recommend looking up his info on one of our garlic planting videos. But that's what's behind me there. So I'm going to plant right up to the line here. And... Then I'm gonna have to move to the other side of the bed to reach, because that gets a little awkward. We did do the raised beds solely for the purpose of protecting. Um, I love dandelions, but I don't want that one growing right there in the way of my beets. Um, protecting the veggies from the pocket gophers who decimated the garden several years in a row, ate everything, but they're also really handy. I hope to actually do more deeper ones at some point. But even just this little 8 inch height um, works to grow everything I want to grow and provides kind of a nice little edge to sit on as you can see while I'm doing some of my planting or weeding or whatever other projects in the garden. It is kind of handy. So get these guys all in. I hear some honeybees flying around, which is good to see. They've been very active, and it always makes me smile to hear one of them fly by on her way to go find honey or, or nectar to make into honey or pollen or whatever else she's working on through the day. So as you can see, there's nothing super complicated or uh, anything about the planting of a garden. The biggest things that require some knowledge, I believe, are learning about good soil and microbial health. And we've done um, a bunch of videos on that, different mineral amendments and testing I've done to help us improve our soil with the particular mineral conditions we have here, um, which are a little bit unique to our high mountain area. 
and also the, the fertilizer, the compost. We will be brewing up a new batch of, of free rotted weed fertilizer here shortly, and that's probably the biggest deal. But actually sticking seeds into the dirt isn't that big of a deal. You just pick varieties that have a chance of doing well in your area and that you have a chance of liking to eat and go for it. You can probably kind of see the little patchwork of zigzagged holes, but I'm just grabbing three seeds or so with my fingertips and pushing them in just a little bit down into the, the soil. And when I'm done here, I can kind of hide the, the holes by just doing that. But until I'm done, I find it helps me keep track of where I'm at in the the bed in my planting by just leaving all my little punched holes be visible. I did change my mind there in the middle. I did plant some bolt, bolt, uh, early wonders of the red beets, but that particular seed packet, because I have had them do really well for us before, seemed to grow a lot of leaves and very little root last year. Um, so I also did some Detroit dark reds. Maybe that was just something last year. Maybe it was those seeds. I'm not sure. But um, we got, like I said, lots of lots of leafy things grow really well here. So we don't usually have any shortage of those. Um, I'd like more more root to grow. But you can eat if you're not familiar. Uh, beet leaves, just like chard. Chard is the same plant basically as a beet. It's just one grown for the leaf instead of for a big fat root. And if you're growing them for the roots anyway, and you've got plenty of them, you can't take all their leaves if you want them to grow. But if you've got lots growing, you can, you know, take some of the leaves and eat them as a, a fresh green. And now I probably need to go around to the other side of the bed because Sometimes I just reach across, but it's a little bit of a stretch. I only said that, now I'm just going to reach. But that is about to be all of our beets planted for the year. And then these on this end are the candy cane ones. They are just really, really pretty. But probably if I had to pick a single beet variety to grow, I would grow the Goldens. They are my favorite, though I really enjoy all of them, and that's why we plant a whole bed of beets. The biggest trick, though, is, like I said, not the sticking the seeds in the dirt. It's the knowing what seeds to stick when into what dirt to produce things that you will want to eat that will grow in your climate and uh, have healthy enough soil to produce healthy plants. That is basically a lifetime of study to keep improving and learning about all those things. So that's done. I'm just going to, you know, kind of mess up the surface so it it seals up my little finger thumb holes I've poked into it and that is that. Okay now we're back to our very first bed here where we put our, our trellises and our peas down the middle and on the edges of this one I'm going to plant carrots. Carrots are something that do very very well for us and again I love all the different colors and varieties if you didn't know Carrots grow in many colors other than orange. Orange was not even a color they originally grew in at all, but we're planting various purples, yellows, oranges, and some orange and purple mixes. I'm going to put these all up and down the sides here, and I'm going to do four on each side. I'm doing coral, which is an orange one, um, cosmic purple, which is beautiful purple on the outside, orange inside, Nanta's scarlet, which is another orange one we really like, and Uzbek golden, which is my very favorite carrot of all, down this side. And on the other side, we're going to plant some, I don't think I've tried this one before, Long Rouge Sang. They're kind of a purple and yellow. Um, Corota Long 8, they always do well. Juan Obtuse Du Bois, 
sorry I'm butchering all these names. That's another yellow one that does pretty well, but I don't love quite as much as the Uzbek Goldens. They're a little bit more of a golden yellow. These are really bright yellow. And Danvers 126 half long, those all do excellent. So let me show you how we put them up and down the sides of the peas. And again, that's so that our, our hoop covers work, our tall stuff's in the middle, and we have shorter stuff on the edges. So I'm starting at this end of the bed with my coral carrots. These are another very tiny seed. I'm trying to weed some grasses that don't belong in here out at the same time. So they are one that I just couldn't plant the other night when it was howlingly windy. They would have ended up in the mountains instead of our garden. So the way I do this, this is another one where I struggle to not plant them too thickly. And I know some people do the cornstarch in the... Um, a little bag with a gel to space them out but I'm doing them kind of like I do my lettuce I'm looking at where they hit the ground which may be really hard for the camera to pick up because they are tiny seeds and they're brown and everything on the surface is brown but I am just scattering them along so that a seeds hitting they're not perfect but approximately like every inch kind of across here is what I'm going for um, every year I get a teeny bit better about not overseeding them too thick and think we have too many carrots I will seed them thinner that'll be great and every year because I seed them thinner they get bigger and more beautiful and we actually get more carrot so that's a kind of nice problem to have so I'm going to go about a fourth of the way down the bed here with this and then switch to the others and once again now that I've got them spread down here what I've found works well is I'm just going to kind of massage the soil surface my peas are down here I can kind of cover up their holes too, but kind of massage my little carrot seeds in because they don't need to go very far under the surface at all. So I'm just going to do this up and down the sides. And again, pull a little weed if I see one. But down here I want to show you something interesting. This is what makes me think that especially in our climate where I'm growing right from, you know, end of snow to snow begin, um, I could maybe plant the entire garden in the fall, do my normal fall cleanup of the other stuff just before the ground freezes, put our, you know, compost and such on the surface, and then plant, because right here is a little pea seedling. I don't know if you guys can see this. He's going to get stepped on the path anyway, so I'm going to show you. This grew from something that dropped here sometime last year, because I didn't have any pea seeds out here until this year. And check this out. See how tall that is? You can see the pea it grew from. It's already a couple inches tall. That just grew from something that had been sitting there since last year. So if that works, why can't I just plant all my garden seeds in the fall and the garden will just come up whenever the snow leaves in the spring? I'm not sure. If I did try that this fall, I think I'll have enough seeds to replant in the spring in case it doesn't work. But this is one of the things that makes me think maybe it would. Also, do you know little pea seedlings, the leaves themselves are edible. They're kind of sweet and taste like fresh sugar snap peas. Very sweet and juicy and taste just like a pea when they're that size. So I'm going to finish massaging my carrot seeds into the soil. And then we have eight of the 11 beds. Of course, our beds are not all the exact same size, but eight of the 11 garden beds are planted. Two with potatoes, this one with carrots and peas, our lettuce one, our beet one, our sugar snap peas and radish one. And so we've only got a few left to go. We'll get to here in just a second. And again, I pull any little weeds I see as I do stuff like this. That way, because I, I won't want to pull any more weeds for, you know, a couple weeks probably to be sure all these things are germinating. Because sometimes when they're coming up, you can't tell if it's a little seedling you want or a little weed seedling. So if I know there's none right now because I just planted it and pulled any, and there wasn't many as you could see, then I know nothing's going to get too out of hand and ahead of my little seedlings until they're big enough to, to tell what's what again. But over time, the first year was the weediest um, after moving the garden or after creating the original one up in the clearing. But over time, as long as I don't ever let anything get big and mature and go to seed, um, 
it seems to get less and less weeds. Not, never none, but less and less into this soil every year. And part of that's because I'm never turning it over. We're doing these raised beds that we just, the most disturbance they get is when you do something like pull a carrot out, but we're never turning the soil up to expose new weed seeds. And it just seems to work really well. Every year the soil gets better as far as the fertility, the soil structure, and I have less weeding. So I'm a big fan. And you wouldn't have to do raised beds in concrete block to do the same thing. You could do a, a like Charles Dowding style mound just on the, the ground surface. If you don't have pocket gophers you're trying to uh, keep out or you can build great big deep ones, all kinds of things. Our setup works very well for what we uh, do, but you can get a lot of the same benefits in many other ways by creating like a lasagna garden, um, whatever. You can look up all these other techniques. They're all kind of different ways of doing the same thing and may make more or less sense for you depending where you live, what your soil conditions are like, if you do or don't have rock right underneath you, if you do or don't have things like pocket gophers, and so on. But that I, I think some form of some of those things where you do not turn or till the soil provides great, great benefits for sure, whether you're in my climate or any others. And now we get to the beds that actually look like something the minute we're done with them because we're going to plant seedlings instead of seeds. As you can tell, I direct sow almost everything. That means planting right into the ground it's going to grow in most things, but I have found that we don't have a long enough growing season for these things. These are cabbages. So I got these from a little local greenhouse. They grow them every year. And um, until we have our own greenhouse set up to effectively do our own healthy seedlings, I will probably continue to buy them from them. And so they are healthy looking little seedlings. I've just found if I, by the time I can plant something in the ground outside here, they just don't have time to make a full cabbage head before fall. So I'm going to space these out. I like to space them before I plant them anytime I'm planting seedlings so I know what I've got before I am unhappy with my spacing and have to dig stuff up and move them. But what I've found over the years works well is, let's see, these beds, blocks are 16 inches, so that's 30, 32 inches wide on the actual soil surface. And I am, once again, I'm staggering them. I do two, one, two, one, and what is that, about a foot in between them, a little, that maybe like 10 inches or so in between them. You, if you have a way, um, well, not way warmer because cabbages like cool weather. They may be a fall, spring, or even winter crop for you because most of what we grow here in the summer is, in our summers, is what would be considered a winter garden in most places, but you may want to space them just a little further apart because they may have time to get a little bit bigger than they will for me. But I'm going to carefully space my seedlings like this down the bed. And this is something I learned oh, probably from my boss Dot when I worked at a, a greenhouse and dried flower farm and strawberry patch for quite a few years when I was in my teens. And uh, she would always lay out all the little seedling plants of anything we were planting and then us girls that work for her could come along and plant them and that way they'd be all organized but it makes it really easy to see if you're getting you know your whole area filled in or if you need to make them a little wider or a little narrower or you know whatever before planting so i do not have all the cabbage i want to plant because i also want to plant purple cabbages because we use them for our danish christmas cabbage and such and so I want a lot. And the, uh, the local greenhouse that grows their own stuff that I prefer to get all my things from never ever grows purple cabbage. I don't know why. So usually I'm able to find some from like one of the hardware stores or something that gets a shipment in of stuff grown in some other greenhouse. And that ends up being my source of purple cabbages. Haven't found any yet this year. So they will be filling up the rest of that end of the bed as soon as I can find some plants, hopefully in the next day or two but I don't have them here today, but I will plant them when I do exactly like I plant the greens. So there is all of my greens. That looks like a nice even spacing. So now I love this little, I think they're called like a hoary hoary knife style of, of trowel. I found this one in a compost pile that uh, 
some other landscaper had lost a long time ago, and I've had it for years now, and I love it. <laughs> it's turned out to be my favorite trowel, but I kind of just wedge it in there, make a little hole, take a little seedling, drop it, its uh, roots in the hole. Cabbages, you don't want to plant any deeper than the soil surface, so I just kind of push them down so there's actually a little dimple cup shaped spot in the soil right around where the cabbage is that uh, kind of lets it collect it's like a little mini uh swale or something to collect water and unlike the i'm not worried about watering the um seeds we've just planted the soil's moist it's gonna rain and so on i, I probably would water them if it was drier um but these i will water because i don't want any of the little seedling roots to end up hanging out in an air pocket under there. So after I, even though the soil is plenty wet, after I get these all planted, I will give a little pour of water into each of their little dimple spots to make sure it washes, you know, loose bits of soil tight up against their roots so that they're not hanging out in the air because most roots don't like to be in the air. So this is how we plant cabbages. And I'm gonna turn around behind me and do the same thing. These look almost identical at this stage because they're a very closely related plant. They're just grown for their flower, not their leaves. These are broccolis, got from the same local greenhouse, and they plant in exactly the same way. Again, I space them out, kind of two, one in the middle, two again. and so on through here. Broccoli is a crop we love. I've got videos on harvesting it, how to know when it's when it's ready to harvest, how we get multiple side shoot crops after the initial harvest, and so on. That's a, a crop we like a lot. I also like cauliflower, but it doesn't do those side shoots. Um, so you get its initial head and nothing else. And so I don't think I'm gonna plant any this year just because I do have limited garden space and it just gives me such a limited crop in return for my, you know, space investment in it um, compared to some of these other things that I like just as much. So cauliflower grows well here, but that's the reason I don't plan to plant any this year. But I'm going to plant broccolis down here. And again, I'm going to have some of the end of the bed open because I'm actually going to put some more cabbage here once I get more cabbage seedlings. Cabbage is one of our biggest crops, along with garlic, onions, and potatoes, and peas, because we eat lots and lots of it. We make sauerkraut, we make, we can Christmas cabbage, we eat lots of it fresh, it keeps for quite a while, and so on. Um, so cabbage is a, a big staple crop for us, and we uh, want to plant a lot of it. So, I'm gonna just stick all of these in the ground, just like you saw me do with those. And then we will have these planted, at least until I can get the rest of the seedlings that I need. And like I said, someday I'll be in a position to start our own and we won't have this issue. Okay, folks, so we're over here in our very last bed. And this one's going to have beans down the center and onions all along both sides. We eat a ton of onions. Well, I guess not a ton. We grew 120 pounds of onions, I believe, last year, and um, I'm down to like the last four in the pantry, and we will run out before these grow. So we could grow a few more than that. Um, beans, I'm gonna do just down the center here. Sometimes they do well for me if we get a warmer summer, and sometimes they don't. These would technically all be what you'd call green beans, but I'm gonna plant golden butter wax, mm -hmm contender, red swan bush, and landris stringless. Those are varieties we have liked. Um, they're all bush beans, and so I don't need a trellis or anything for them to grow on, but otherwise I'm going to plant them just like my peas. Okay, come here. Come over here. You can come around here and lay on this side. Come over here. Brilly's been getting very bored with having to chill and not be allowed to go chew things, but he's otherwise doing well. So I'm going to do the same kind of zigzag pattern just down the center here. These I'm pushing in a little deeper, closer to an inch. Um, 
and I'm doing kind of a single zigzag, two, one, two, one, um, whatever you would call that pattern. So yeah, if we have a warm summer, sometimes we get a pretty good crop of, of beans and we enjoy them. And sometimes if we get a lot of hard frost and freezes, like last year when it was 10 degrees on June 21st, which is the first day of summer, as well as a lot of other hard freezes through the summer, they just don't, um, they make a little bush and they don't really produce anything. You gotta stay where I can see you, baby. Yeah, you can walk around, but you gotta stay where I can see you. And then we will do the onions all up and down the sides. So I'm gonna go along here and just plant all of my beans, and then we will go to doing onions. If you're wondering about the plastic covering behind me here, that is hopefully going to get a little corn patch this year, though I don't know that it will grow. That plastic has been killing the quack grass for the past two years. I was hoping to plant it last spring, but by last spring, which was, whatever, three quarters of a year after I'd put the plastic down, the grass roots under there were still not dead. I think they are now. But here again, you can see how getting them just a little further in the ground, doing my same pattern down the center of the bed. And I'm going to, again, leave my holes showing so that I know where my beans are while I plant the onions. Um, then I can kind of you know, mess up and push the, the soil back over the hole. But for now, it's useful for me to be able to see where my little holes are that I drop each bean seed into. So onions are another thing that I buy some seedlings of. They uh, grow best from seed for me, not sets. We usually get spectacular onions. But again, I just don't have the setup that's proper for growing my own seedlings. So I get these from their local greenhouse but they plant quite a few in each of these little packs so if you kind of massage the pack they pop out but see how all their roots are all bunched together the soil is pretty moist i can pull them apart but it will injure them some so what i've got in this bucket is just a couple inches of water and i'm going to kind of just swirl them in there see how it's washing the soil off the roots we're going to get them to loosen up and come apart as much as we can without breaking all of the roots. Um, this just helps a little bit with breaking less roots to get them all apart. So there you can see it's coming apart more. It's hard to show you what I'm doing under the water, but I'm kind of just massaging them gently as I shake them in the water with my fingertips and they are loosening up. Um, these are Walla Wallas. I usually plant Walla Wallas and candies. Uh, they do very well here. And I've got some Spanish sweets as well. We had several two pound onions last year. They were Walla Wallas. So now you can see how I was able to pull that guy out and he's got most all of his roots. You still got to do it gently and you'll break a root or two, but they've got most of their roots because they came apart in the water. So once again though, with little plants, I can see my bean holes. I'm going to lay these out so that I can see where each one is before I start planting. And I'm going to just stagger that back and forth, back and forth on this side of the beans. I want them to have plenty of room because I know these guys can get fairly large. Um, so what am I doing? Five, six inches between each of them in a, in a zigzagged pattern like that. And I'm just laying each one of them out here. Very carefully. And then we will go to planting the whole row. And I'm going to do it on both sides where I stuck the beans. So there's one batch. <clears throat> so again, starting with this. Just gonna, I'll, there's, there'll be a lot of soil in this water when I'm done. I'll just pour it back over the bed. That's just fine. I'll kind of massage them apart. That's mostly come apart. I'm gonna do the same thing, lay these out on this side. 
this is ideal weather right now for transplanting seedlings of any kind, whether it's the broccolis or cabbages or this or anything else. It's kind of cool and overcast where it doesn't get uh, any heat stress onto the plants. I don't always get ideal weather for what I want, but uh, this today is actually perfect for what I'm doing here. So I'm going to space these out the whole way down through. But before that, I can show you how I plant them. Onions can be buried a little bit, unlike the, the broccoli and cabbage, but I just put my shovel in and kind of and rock it so that I've got a nice big hole to kind of tuck all those roots down in. But then I just pack the soil around it. And again, I'm making a, a little dimply cup right around where I bury the roots. And then I'll come back and pour some water into there to be sure that they don't have air pockets around those, especially on these where I've pulled their roots all apart from the soil um, because the roots going into air pockets aren't very happy. So we will water these in here in a minute and they will get to growing. Now onions tend to grow very, very slow and you should check where you're at if you're, it's kind of backwards sounding from what I think would make sense, but if you're in a warmer area, you need short day onions because you have less total daylight hours. And very far north areas like ours, um, long day onions do better because we have long daylight hours in the summer because they're so short in the winter. And so check that as far as what varieties will grow. But onions are relatively easy to grow, pretty hardy, very few pests like to eat them. So that is a big plus. The same is true for garlic, very few pests like to eat garlic. Um, not none. Pocket gophers will eat garlic and onions. You can read books that say they won't, but they did. Um, but they do grow really, really slow. These were probably started, I would guess, back in January or early February to get to this size. And they still look just kind of like fat grasses. And they will sit here like this, looking like fat grasses. And still looking like fat grass. And not looking like they're growing. Then along about midsummer, they'll finally start to grow just a teeny bit. Then they'll grow a teeny bit more. Then toward fall, all of a sudden they bulge up and make two pound onions. Um, I don't know why they take so long, but they do. So if your onions look like they're sitting there doing nothing, don't worry about them. Just be patient. I know some people will cut the, talk about trimming the tops off to make the bulbs grow. That seems rather absurd to me since the, the leaves are what produces the food and energy largely, as well as the roots to, just heard a hummingbird fly by, to, uh, you know, grow the bulb. So that seems very counterproductive. I suspect what's often happening is that the onion's been sitting there doing nothing and nothing and nothing, and then somebody cuts some leaves off because they think it's never gonna grow a bulb, but it's about the time it was finally gonna grow a bulb anyway, but they end up with a smaller bulb than they otherwise would have because they damage the leaves by cutting them off. So. I know there are gardeners who do that. I personally would not and never do. And like I said, we get, you know, one to two pound onions uh, pretty consistently most years here. So that is how we do this. And now we're gonna go up and down the whole bed planting these. And then that is the whole garden planted for the year. Well then my turnip seeds I need to get back from my brother and I'm finding some purple cabbages. Later that afternoon, I had to run and uh, meet a friend for something in a neighboring town, and I checked the little hardware store's greenhouse there, and they did have some purple cabbage, so I was able to pick them up and get the rest of the stuff planted. So the, and then after work, my brother stopped by with my package of um, seeds that I was missing. So now the whole garden is planted for the year, and so that is pretty exciting. Thanks for spending your valuable time with us. I hope you learned something interesting and useful. Or found something beautiful here.